Good morning, everybody. See, oops, there's like 10 people outside. So sort of the standard Friday morning after a, after a week off. And, I get it. Yeah. Um, but we are so happy to have a man that needs no introduction, so I'm not going to do an introduction. But I did just tell Dr. Chuck Hicks that we're going to play our five-question game, and he has no idea what the questions are. <laughs> um, but I think he'll handle it very well. Okay. So, we'll see about Yes. So, Dr. Hicks, can you tell us um, where you hail from and how you ended up in San Diego? Yeah, my, uh, my dad was in the Army, so I moved all over the country as a kid and uh, went to med school in Washington, D.C., did residency in San Francisco, went back to Virginia, and was in the Army, worked uh, and did my ID training at Walter Reed. When I got out of the Army, I went to Duke for 20 years, and then Chip Schooley and Davey and others were foolish enough to tempt me to move out here, and since my wife is from Southern California, that was kind of like I had no negotiating power. So here we are. And for those who don't know, he, um, you were here for you, you almost four years. Four years, and you're still here as the um, as the Owen Clinic director. And tell us what you're doing now. Now I work for V Healthcare, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit because you need to know about that to interpret the comments that I, I make today. Uh, v Healthcare is a company that was formed ten years ago from the HIV branch of GlaxoSmithKline, Pfizer, and a Japanese company called Shionogi. And subsequent to that, the assets from Bristol-Myers Squibb were also acquired when BMS uh, went out of the anti-infective business. And so those are the constituent parts. And uh, the only thing that Beef Healthcare does is HIV. So we're totally focused on one therapeutic area. And what do you do at Vive? Yeah, so I'm called the Senior Global Medical Director, and no, no one, including me, actually knows what that is. Except, thank you. And um, I work from home, uh, which is harder than it seems. Um, you need more discipline than I have to do that very effectively. I'm also eight time zones west of our headquarters in London, and three time zones west of our headquarters in Raleigh-Durham, so the timing for conference calls and things is a little problematic. I travel a lot. Uh, I'm global, so I, I, I go to other countries frequently. I don't sell. I'm not in the promotional department. I'm in research and development. I meet with people in different countries who are uh, leading the HIV effort there to learn the, the, the issues they're dealing with and to try and uh, understand if the <laughs> kinds of things we're doing are relevant to their um, work, and if not, what we might do to help them uh, find better ways to care for people with HIV. It's kind of a dream job, actually. Sometimes I, I can't believe I get paid. That sounds really nice. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna lighten the mood even more, and just I, I feel like every time I see you, a, a new a new person comes into the world in your life. Um, how many grandchildren are you up well, to now? We, we only have two. But oh, we sorry. Have it seems like it was a lot. We have, we have <laughs> a lot. A lot. Three children. Uh, the oldest lives in San Francisco with his wife and that eight-month-old uh, second granddaughter. My middle son lives here in San Diego and works for Illumina. He's a scientist, did his PhD at UCSF and his postdoc at MIT, met his wife there. She works at UCSD in the uh, donor relations development office. Um, and then my daughter is married to Maureen, and they live in Massachusetts now, but next summer they'll be coming back to San Diego, and they have a 19-month-old who's our first grandchild. So it's pretty lucky. Davey told me to ask you something embarrassing, but I didn't come up with anything fast enough. So I'm going to finish with what's your, <laughs> well, what's your favorite thing to do in San Diego? Uh, we love the beach. We wish we could live closer to the beach. I haven't decided what bank to rob in order to make that okay. happen. <laughs> um, we live in South Park, which we also love. We like to walk up to uh, the neighborhood restaurants are some great places to eat uh, within a couple blocks of where we live. And uh, I'm a big uh, wine fan, so I like to go to the wine country and, and uh, spend time there and drink too much. That's exactly what I wanted to hear at the end. Okay, I'll let you go now. Okay. okay. Those were easy, man. I thought there was going to be something evil. Okay, so, uh, I wor so let me get to the next slide. So I work for Vive Healthcare. You always have to know who your speaker is and what his angle is. How is he or she being paid? 
who does he or she, who are they beholden to, so that you can interpret what they're saying in the in the proper way. That said, I, I'm I'm going to endeavor to. This is not a promotional talk. Sometimes we do promotional talks. When we do a promotional talk, it's confined to information that the FDA says is in the package in, uh, prescribing information. But this is a scientific talk. So I am not constrained by that, but you should know that some of the things I'm gonna talk about are not FDA approved, but I'm gonna try and provide the evidentiary basis for all the things that, that I say. But again, you should know my bias, I work for V. Okay, we're running a little behind. This one I was at the Owen Clinic. So I'd like to ask you to ask yourself, am I really that sick? Or will I just be wasting the doctor's valuable time? So <laughs> my goal this morning is not to waste the doctor's valuable time. We actually had a nurse that did that. I was just like, wow, those were the days. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about two, using two drugs to treat HIV. This flies in the face of 20 years of having three drugs are necessary, three drugs are necessary, beat them into our heads. It's part of the catechism of the guidelines. But I'm gonna to try to make the argument that maybe the time has come where we can revisit that. There are examples of how with improvements and tools available to manage diseases, we have de-intensified therapy. So when I was a, a resident, actually there was a pre-antibiotic era, but when we did get antibiotics, and somebody was diagnosed with pneumonia, we gave them two weeks of therapy. That was how, that's, that's how you treat pneumonia. If you go to up to date now and you look at community acquired outpatient management of pneumonia, it's four days if you use azithromycin, five to seven days if you use doxycycline. So we thought this was what we needed. Perhaps we got better tools. We tested the hypothesis could be done with less and it looks like that worked. We used to treat urinary tract infections routinely for two weeks. Now we know that trimethrum sulfa for three days is sufficient. We went to one day, that was insufficient. Now we're at three days. Probably the most recent observation about how we de-intensified therapy when we had better tools was hepatitis C. In 2010, the standard of care was interferon alpha plus ribavirin for 24 to 48 weeks, and the cure rates were pretty abysmal. Now we have sofosfavir and vilpatosfavir for 12 weeks, pan-genotypic responses. The vast majority of people are cured in just 12 weeks of therapy. So as tools get better with infectious diseases, it's possibly true that we can at least test the hypothesis that we can accomplish the goals we seek with less intense therapy than we've used in the past. So this is what I meant to push the button for. This button is hard, Marvin. There we go. So what about our tools? I, I, was, uh, I saw my first HIV patient in 1980, before many of you were born. I was an intern and I was uh, working in the emergency department at San Francisco General. And during the month that I was rotating through the ED, probably half a dozen young gay men came in and had uh, things that we'd never seen before. I remember going up to look at the chart, uh, a dermatology biopsy, and it said K-A-P-O-S-I. And I, I totally unfamiliar with that term. I wrote it on a piece of paper. Couldn't look online, didn't have computers, went back, pulled out Harrison's. And it said an unusual multicentric malignancy, mostly found in middle and older persons from Mediterranean area. And this was a 25 year old, you know, gay San Francisco guy who'd never been to the Mediterranean, and yet he had this disease. And it wasn't too long thereafter, 1982, that the syndrome called uh, immune. Uh, acquired immune deficiency syndrome or AIDS was made and, and remarkably, now it seemed short, then it seemed really long. Three years later, we had an approved test, a blood test to be able to diagnose HIV. And then in 1987, 
just five years after the first cases were reported, we had the first drug, Zidovudine. And then it took a long time to get the second drug, DDI, and then the third drug, probably the worst drug ever made, possibly for any disease, DDC, uh, which fortunately now has an asterisk, which is no longer marketed, thank goodness. It's a try, a valid try, but a terrible drug. And then we started to get other classes of drugs, not just uh, shooting at reverse transcriptase, but now protease. And in 1996, the World AIDS meeting was in Vancouver. And at that meeting, the first results from three drug combination therapy that involved the protease inhibitor and two nucleosides showed that people could survive for what seemed like the long term. And that the combination of those three drugs was necessary because fewer than three drugs had proven insufficient. Things have gone on. It became really interesting in 2007 when the first HIV integrase inhibitor was approved, and that leads us to the current era. So we started out here. People took lots of pills. I used to teach a class when I was at Duke for, in the women's health program, and I would bring in one day's supply of medicine in one of those big pink or pink, those big, big orange pharmacy bottles. And the people in the class were just like, people take that many medicines? And as we got better tools, the number of pills was diminished. The treatment results were better. As we added in integrase inhibitors, things got better still. And we began to have a total change in our perspective. We went from depression and doom and gloom to a very positive outlook for most people living with HIV. And we come now to the era in which we find ourselves. And I wanna explore just for a moment why three drugs became the standard. I was on the DHHS guidelines committee uh, until I joined pharma uh, when I then became public enemy number one and was thrown out of the room unceremoniously. Um, but we talked a lot about three drugs. The guidelines say, even for switching, you should switch to a new regimen that contains two or preferably three active agents. Three, 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 drummed into our head. Why? First, we did single agent therapy. We only had one drug. Uh, the head of the ID division at Duke published a paper in the New England Journal. The topic of the paper was, should we start AZT now when we first make a diagnosis or should we wait until they get AIDS? Because we knew we only got so much. And so it was a randomized trial done through the VA cooperative study group to see if the proper timing was early or late. A reflection of the futility of the kinds of therapy we had. So if you gave somebody a single nucleoside like ACT, you got a bump in CD4 cells that tend to taper down over time. You got about a half a log, threefold decline. If the viral load was 80,000, it maybe went down to 25,000. But then virus became resistant. We learned about resistance and things went back to where they were. And the drug really no longer provided much in the way of clinical benefit. So we saw, decided maybe two. And all we had at the time were nucleosides. So AZT, 3TC, combined much better bump in CD4s, significant greater drop in viral replication, but pretty easy for resistance to develop, and the same thing happened. And it wasn't until we got the third drug that those lines didn't seem to start to come back together again. And that took us up to 1996, the Vancouver World AIDS meeting. So it became clear as we iteratively worked from one to two to three, that three was the sweet spot. But the drugs we had at the time, the two trials presented in Vancouver were protease inhibitor-based trials. One used in Dinavir, where you took two tablets every eight hours, not three times a day, every eight hours on an empty stomach. You're juggling, I gotta get it two hours before I eat, 
for four hours after I eat, but it has to be eight hours apart. It's terribly difficult for people to do. Or ritonavir, a drug we still use as a booster, but ritonavir given at therapeutic dose of 600 milligrams twice a day. You had to have a cast iron stomach to be able to do that. So it's possible, but not very many people were able to achieve this and sustain it. But pharma continued to work on drugs. They all want to make a lot of money in the market. They need better drugs. And as we went from 1996, when less than half of the people that started treatment were able to suppress virus, into the first part of this century and through the first decade of this century, the proportion of people with success increased. So by 2010 or so, now we're three years into integrase inhibitor therapy era, we're up to around 75 or 80 percent of people. So our mindset in the clinic, you know, when I was at Duke in the early mid 90s, early 2000s, at the end of each week, we'd have a meeting of the staff, the whole staff of the clinic, and the first thing we did was read the names of the people that had died that week. It was very, uh, very moving and, and terrible. For young, mostly men, but also some young women. But, and, then, and then we'd say, okay, but now on the bright side, let's say, does anybody have a person whose viral load's undetectable? The cutoff was 1,000 then. And, and we'd have a few, and everybody would go, wow, how did you do it? You know, why did that happen? How can I get that same outcome as some of my patients? By 2010, and in this decade, when we have a meeting, we used to meet in Owen Clinic, probably still do, we talk about the people that weren't undetectable. Why aren't they undetectable? Our presumption when we start therapy is people are gonna be undetectable. And that got even more true when we got better integrase inhibitors, so-called second generation, dolutegravir, bictegravir. Now, in 2019, when we look at clinical trial results, if we don't have 90% at the end of one year that are below the level of detection, 90%, then we think that's not a very good drug. And honestly, th these numbers, I think are as, as well as you can ever achieve in a clinical trial because almost all of the non-suppressed patients are not suppressed because they didn't get a sample done at the time point. They dropped out of the study. They got run over by a bus. They were in jail. Uh, and, and there are very few that are actually virologic failures, as we'll look through that. We're pretty happy, right? We have single tablet regimens. They work 90% of the time. They're pretty well tolerated, take care of most of the problems. So why even, why even think about this? Why jeopardize all the good stuff that's happened over the last 30 years? Well, part of the consequence of better therapy is that people are living a lot longer. This takes us back to the first patients who were able to get suppression. If you looked at the population of everyone with HIV, if you took a 20-year-old guy and started him on therapy and he became undetectable, it was thought, was modeled based on data from Kaiser that that person would live 20 more years. A person with eight, without HIV who was 20 years old in 1996 would live 63 more years. So still a pretty big gap. But as the treatment got better and as a bigger proportion of the pool of people in the category increased, the gap really slowed really narrowed. This is 2011, eight years ago. It's even narrower now. Pretty much we tell patients, if you take this and stay connected to healthcare and come into the clinic regularly, you're probably going to live as many years as you were going to live anyway. So this is exciting. This is good. But it also means it's not yeah, I have these great pauses and the slide's supposed to change for those things. Um, it also means we have a lot of people that are getting older in the clinic. And although half of the people we care for get infected as a young man or a young woman in their 30s or 20s or even teens, 
We also now in 2020, next year, half of the people in the United States with HIV will be 50 or older. San Francisco, it's already about two thirds. And so the estimated life expectancy, if you're 30, the notion now is you'll, you'll probably be on treatment for 45 years unless we get a cure. I used to tell patients that and they would be so kind of horrified. Sometimes I think they just said, you know, F it, I'm not gonna do this. It's this crazy, I don't wanna take pills for 50 years. So then I changed my pitch. I said, well, we're working really hard on a cure. And our job, you and me working together, is to get you to the point where we have a cure in the best possible shape you can be. Your immune system as strong as it can be. So that when you are cured, you'll be able to be like really normal, able to do it. But the reality is we're not close to a cure. And projections are that most people with HIV will be on treatment now for years and years and years and years. What does that mean? terms of exposure. AZT, the first antiretroviral drug, was actually developed as a cancer drug. And as a cancer drug, it had meaningful toxicity. Every drug, every licensed pharmaceutical has toxicity. For some, it's quite modest. For others, it's quite profound. And we balance the risk and the benefit of the drug with what the toxicity is. But a corollary of that then is we, we don't want people to have to take more different drugs than they actually need. If you're on a four drug regimen, which is two nukes and a boosted third drug, l vitagravir or a protease inhibitor, then you take 1,460 doses of medicine just for your antiretroviral therapy in a year. If you're on a standard triple drug regimen without a booster, it's just over 1,000. And if we could be successful with two drugs, it's fewer, it's 730. And if you multiply that by almost 40 years, this number is based on a paper that projected a lifespan of 39.1 years, then you can change 57 or 43,000 to 28 or 29,000. Is that good? I can't prove it. But intuitively, the notion that I got exposed to fewer chemicals over those 39.1 years has appeal. No one should take more medicine than they need to. We want people to be on all the medicine they need. We don't want them to have more medicine than they need. So that's part one. Part two is, are there toxicities to our current treatment regimens? Undoubtedly. If you ask the question, when did we identify and when did clinical practice impact occur when toxicities of various drugs were recognized? It can take a long time. Here's AZT, approved in 87 by the Food and Drug Administration. Lipoatrophy, one of many. We knew some of the toxicities right away, gastrointestinal toxicity, anemia, but one of the ones that was most dreaded by patients, lipoatrophy, wasn't recognized for 12 years. DDI, D4T, 94, same thing, five years. You can go down the list. So the general issue is that a, you, know, you may have seen a slide, I, I might have put it in here. A new drug is introduced, it looks fantastic, interest and enthusiasm for it goes very high, the drug is G-O-D. Then side effects start to occur, people start to not respond to therapy, resistance is identified, the interest plummets, and it goes from G-O-D to D-O-G. And then it sort of reaches its real, this is the value of the drug, this is the negative of the drug. All of these drugs, all of these drugs, our drug, Dalutegravir, licensed in 2013, psychiatric effects really recognized two years later. Now, 2019, we're talking more about weight gain. Weight gain, excessive weight gain. What you don't see on here is 
tenofovir alafenamide at the most recent two conferences, ID Week and the IAS meeting in Mexico City, you saw data that has caused a lot of questions about does CAF accelerate and enhance weight gain, especially when it's given with an integrase inhibitor, compared to TDF. So we're kind of in that CAF, maybe summitin coming down. A lot more to learn. CAF is a fantastic drug. It's used enormously in combination single tablet regimens. But, but just wish to point out that any antiretroviral drug will have toxicity if enough people take it and they take it for long enough. So why a two drug regimen? Well, as much as is needed, as little as possible as it relates to the medicines we ask people to take. We'd like to reduce potentially the impact of accumulated long-term exposure to multiple antiretroviral drugs. And most importantly, the drugs that we have available to us today are sufficiently interesting, have characteristics that allow us to at least investigate in a controlled scientific manner the possibility that our long time intrinsically held catechism belief that you have to use three drugs may no longer apply. The fewer drugs, the fewer drug-drug interaction issues, and it might reduce costs. The US is very opaque for providers as related to costs. We almost never think about it in the decisions we make. We're the only country in the world that is that cavalier about costs. And as I show you some of the other studies, you'll note that a high proportion of them were done in Europe, where costs are a much more important issue. And ultimately, this will become a more important issue in the US as well. So all right, if you accept this background, this argument, that maybe at least we should explore the idea of two drugs, what do we want in our two drug combination? We, patients expect, and we believe improved adherence follows when the drug that's prescribed is a single tablet and relatively small. Has to be well tolerated. Patients have to be willing to take it. It has to have a high genetic barrier. That's a term that's widely misunderstood, but in its essence, a drug that resists the development of resistance. Probably a good idea to target different parts of the HIV life cycle, drug-drug interactions. We don't want to not be able to give it if somebody has tuberculosis. We don't want to not be able to give it if somebody's on a lipid-lowering agent and it needs a favorable cost profile. So let's see what we might do. Let's see what evidence exists as to whether two drugs might suffice. Okay two major categories. First is treatment naive, people diagnosed not yet started on therapy, and first we'll look at that. And then the second category is so-called switch therapy. Now switch therapies become the major driver of new prescriptions. If, if I was, you know, uh, if, if I had Davy Smith as the CEO of my company and my drug was, was Daviavir, and I, it was great, and Daviavir was so good that 90% of people who got HIV knew were put on Daviavir, and that's all we got, Daviavir would collapse in a year. Because there's only about 25,000 people that start therapy in any one year. So the CEO, Davy, says, okay, that's all well and good. We gotta get people to switch from what they're on now to Daviavir so that I can get that Tesla that I've really been wanting to have. So switching, both commercially and for valid clinical reasons, has become perhaps the major category. First, we'll look at treatment naive. I think it's fair to say that it's a bigger challenge to a drug to take a person that's never been treated and make their viral load reach a level below detection of the assay and sustain that. That's probably harder than taking people who are already suppressed 
and changing their treatment and sustaining the success of the previous drug. But we're gonna look at both. So I would argue that this is a harder barrier. Okay, so what's been done in two drug therapy? Well, first, the first sort of main central third agents were protease inhibitors. And so protease inhibitors in two drug combinations were paired up with nucleosides, non-nukes, and maraviroc. The studies that are in green represent those in which two drugs appeared to do as well as three. The yellow are, it's kind of inconclusive, and the red are, it clearly didn't work. This is not a good two drug combination. So we're going to we can't go through all of these. I'm going to briefly talk about the Andes study because it's a good representation of what we did first. When we got integrase inhibitors, the idea was these are fantastic. These are fantastic. Why don't we just pair them up? ACTG did that. Uh, NEAT in Europe did that. ANRS, Deltegravir, uh, Darivir, Ritonavir. Not so good. And then integrase inhibitors with one nucleoside, the Gemini studies, that's our company, and I'm going to talk about that. That looks pretty good, as you'll see. Okay, so let's look at some of the early attempts that weren't quite as good. And, and this, again, is going to, I hope, reflect the argument that our tools for dealing with HIV are so much better that earlier attempts, which are not so successful, it's really a function of the drugs we had available to us. This was a ACTG study 5142, and the comparison was the treatments of the day, either efavirenz or the protease inhibitor, lopinavir, ritonavir, with two nucleosides. That, that was standard of care. That's how you started treatment uh, in newly diagnosed patients. But someone said, well, why don't we just combine these two? Because this is really potent, and this is really potent. We'll do efavirenz and lopinavir, ritonavir. And if you look at virologic outcome, it actually was pretty good. It was pretty good. But you had high rates of failure with resistance, significantly higher than the other two arms. And the tolerability of efavirenz and lopinavir was poor. So as an option, as a strategy, efavirenz and lopinavir never really was much of, a, of a, a standard of care choice. And I'd say almost no one uses that now. But the Andes trial, which is more current, used the protease inhibitor darunavir, boosted with ritonavir, plus 3TC. And we're going to come back to 3TC because totally, this is totally off label. This is not the FDA, no. But Pedro Kahn, who's a wonderful investigator from Argentina, who's done a lot of this work, is the one that actually convinced Viv to try dolutegravir and 3TC, told me once that 3TC is, is the secret sauce. It's the magic in the combination. I'm going to try and share a little bit of, of why he thought that was true. But here's an early study done, darunavir plus 3TC, versus a three-drug standard therapy, darunavir plus two nucleosides, one of which was 3TC, a relatively small study, 70 and 75 in the two arms. But overall, the three-drug arm, I'm sorry, two-drug arm, 95% were less than uh, 400 copies at week 24 when this first report, 97 in the three-drug. And importantly, some people said, you're going to lose a lot of potency if you only use two, but the proportion of patients with a viral load greater than 100,000 in both arms, 100% suppressed. So, huh, gosh, this and this are the same, except we've taken this out of the equation. And we know TDF has some issues, causes renal disease in some patients, tends to cause demineralization of bones. So if this is as good, if it's as good, that might be a good pathway to think about. Which brings us to the Gemini study. Now, all of the VIV studies are cleverly named in a painstaking process to pick something that's very clever. Gemini, of course, is 
so any Geminis in the audience? So it's two, right? Twins. So two drugs. Clava. Here's our man, Pedro Khan. He presented this in Mexico City. It's uh, treatment with two drugs versus three in naive patients. So here's the study design. Viral load up to 500,000 in this study. Randomized to dolutegravir and 3TC or dolutegravir TDF and FTC, Truvada. And people say, well, why did you use this? Why didn't you use PATH? Because that's what we use nowadays. This was an international study. And most of these countries don't have PATH. It's not been marketed in those countries. And one axiom of clinical trials research is that whatever treatment people volunteer to be on, if it turns out to be successful, that treatment must be available to the people after the trial is done. So TDF was used. When you combine, there are two studies of identical design because FDA approval requires two independently done studies. When you combine the populations, there's about 1,433 patients in the trial. So it's a big study. It's, it, it did pretty good, 15%, about one in six, one in five, one in six of the people enrolling was female. Not great, but not horrible. A reasonable distribution of ethnicities, although more whites than would have been liked. 20% had viral load greater than 100,000. Uh, and so we had a reasonable amount of higher viral load patients. Here's the data. The first primary endpoint was at week 48. And you can see here that the three drug regimen, 93.3 by snapshot FDA, suppressed two drugs, 91.5. Those are not different. So two drug therapy was not inferior to three drug therapy. The trial has now been reported through two years, 89 versus 86, not different. Two drug therapy is not inferior to three drug therapy. So now the evidence behind two drugs may be growing a little bit. 700 patients got it. Response rates in the 90 plus percent category. And I want you to remember this number, 91.5 at 48 weeks, because that's going to come back in a future slide. What about failure? So one of the arguments against two drugs is you're more likely, you might do well in the overall population, but you probably have more people fail. You just don't have enough potency with two drugs. And 3TC is a drug without a lot of resistance to resistance, has a low genetic barrier. So won't you fail with resistance? So here's the failures in Gemini 1, Gemini 2, here pooled together. In the two drug, there are six confirmed virologic failures at one year and 11 at the end of two years. For the three drug, it's four and seven, so slightly more, but in a trial of 700, 1.5% 1 virologic failures over two years is in the very highest outcomes category. And most importantly, None of the people that failed in either arm had demonstrable resistance, not to 3TC, not to dolutegravir. There were a moderate, as there always are, rate of adverse events, slightly fewer in the two drug arm, as you'd expect, it's one less drug than in the three drug arm, but no difference in the number of people that discontinued therapy because of adverse events. Okay, so that looks pretty good. Is it rational now in 2019 to think about starting somebody on a two drug regimen? Maybe, but let's look more at SWITCH. Darcy. Can you just comment on um, baseline resistance in the study and also um, chronic hepatitis B infection in terms of exclusion criteria? Stay tuned, because that's, I'm going to talk at the end about what are the objections to this strategy? If you believe that it's now at least a rational thing to consider, 
what are the objections? I'll try and cover that. If I haven't answered it, tell me. Okay, we're going to do switch now. Same kind of a, a graph, protease inhibitors, studies that combine protease inhibitors with the secret sauce for ETC, that combine protease inhibitors with Maraviroc and use uh, protease inhibitor and Fovren. So we already saw the, something with that. And these look pretty good. These didn't look very good. Integrase inhibitors, integrase plus NNRTI, rolpivirine, cabotegravir, a different integrase, plus rolpivirine, and dolutegravir and 3TC. So let's take a look at some of this. Switch. Okay, Ole. So Ole is here. It's just one of these four, because I don't have time to go through more, and it's boring to go through the same thing over and over again. But Ole uh, was done by Jose Gatel. A wonderful investigator from Barcelona. He now has the same job I do uh, for Viv, but is uh, headquartered in Barcelona where he lives. Took HIV patients who were suppressed on three drug therapy, less than 50. Um, and they, at that time, they kind of had like RPI in Spain is lopinavir. So people were on lopinavir plus either 3TC or FTC in a second nucleoside, they had to be suppressed for at least six months and have no known resistance to lopinavir, 3TC, or FTC. And they're randomized to go to uh, the, basically the drug combination they're on, or a two drug, lopinavir, ritonavir, plus the mividine or m -tricytabine. And here's the results. This is 48-week data. This is... Uh, the response in the, this is the two drug arm, 91.5 suppressed at 48 weeks, the three drug arm, 90.9, not different. Virologic failure rate, 2.5% in both arms, discontinuation rates shown here. So, and it's a reasonably big study, a couple hundred in each arm. Uh, there were more, more higher lipid levels in the two drug arm because as you know, TDF is a lipid lowering agent, so they went up. Lab abnormalities were similar, but importantly, there was virologic failure in three patients in the three drug arm, and three patients in the two drug arm, and one patient in the two drug arm had M184V and K103N. So one failure out of 200 and however many, start, uh, I'm sorry, out of 118. So failure rate with resistance of less than 1%. All right, well, what about uh, switching people who are suppressed to dolutegravir plus rolpivirine, the SWORD studies? These were pretty big. Again, people who were stable on a three-drug combination for at least six months, randomized to the two-drug dolutegravir, rolpivirine, or continuing their standard care. Oops, and actually the results are here. At the, at the end of 48 weeks, 95% uh, in both arms remained suppressed. This study has now been taken out to two years, so right here, and it's still 89% by snapshot are undetectable. And in the group that switched here, who have one year of follow-up, 93% were suppressed. So those fit right in with the best kind of results we have in switch studies. And resistance, none in the first 48 weeks. This patient had K101KE mixture, none to integrase. This patient, uh, as it turned out, using archived DNA resistance testing, was enrolled in the study with archived resistance to both nucleosides and integrase, and those resistance mutations appeared in his treatment failure. But again, this is three patients out of over a thousand. Sorry if this is a bad question. I know E138, um, but the other two, I'm not sure their clinical relevance. They're, um, not, they're not primary mutations, okay. but if you engineer a virus with this and you add this, the fold change is higher. If you only have this, it, it's still susceptible, but it's kind of a, an adaptation of the virus to uh, be able to grow better. 
a good question, actually. And unfortunately, this patient who had, uh, who had a G193, uh, they were unable to amplify integrase. So this could have been integrase resistance, but we, we don't know. Okay, so now we have uh, our most recent presentation, which is called Tango. Get it? Two to Tango. Gemini, Tango. So clever. So clever. In this case, we took a more contemporaneous group of patients, people on cath containing regimens. Okay, so we don't have the complaint that, well, you use TDF instead of cath. So now we're going to take people on TAF. They can be on any other drug with the TAF. They have stable suppression for at least six months, less than 50, and they're going to stay on their TAF based regimen or they're going to switch to dolutegravir or 3 tc the two drug combination. And here's the countries, and this is the primary endpoint, week 48. Okay. This is the study population, abysmal in its enrollment of women, less than 10%. Very disappointing. Mostly white, gay white men. And hugely important, the most, most prevalent risk factor among populations of people living with HIV. But we need to be able to answer the question, does this also work in, in other populations? So we'll see. Uh, most people had a, a good CD4 count. And how about what were they switching on? What were they on when they were enrolled in the study? Most of them were on Elvitegravir, Genvoya. Most of them, 78% on integrase, 14% on ropivirine-based regimens mostly, and only 8% uh, on boosted PI, mostly darunavir. Here's the results. Now, with switch trials, the FDA has changed the way they want you to interpret and report the data. Instead of saying what proportion remains suppressed, they want to know at the end of the primary endpoint, what proportion had virologic failure. So that's what this is. Okay, so at the week 48 visit, what proportion each of the arms had a viral load greater than 50? 0.3%, this is one patient in the two drug arm, and 0.5%, that's two patients in the three drug arm. If you turn the question around and say, what's the percentage that are suppressed? It's 93 for two drugs, 93 for uh, three drugs. And most of the people that are considered not considered to be successful, that's because they didn't show up for that visit for one reason or another. So, so these are, it's like, wow, that's pretty good. And here are the force plots. This is for the failure and this is for the suppressed. And obviously they're both not inferior. So that's pretty good. Again, one person and two people uh, here's the reasons for no virologic data. You see they are buried in. Uh, and then the question again, okay, this seems reasonable. I'm really worried about virologic failure and resistance. There was no virologic failure in the two drug arm with resistance. It's one here, no resistance at treatment failure. Okay. So that's pretty compelling, and the data has been sent to the FDA to uh, allow a diagnosis of switch therapy to be a reason for prescribing uh, dolutegravir 3 tc A second study is being done. Uh, I'm not sure how you get two out of this, but it's called SALSA, cleverly enough, and it will take people on any suppressive regimen, it doesn't just have to be TDF or TAF. And that study is uh, not gonna be reported, there's still a, a ways to go before there'll be data from that. Okay, so maybe, maybe if you look at these data, especially the more recent data, you get a sense that, well, maybe two drugs is okay, but I'm still nervous. I spent 20 years being told you have to use three drugs, I'm just, you know, I'm, and I'm not unhappy with what I have for three drugs, right? Doesn't, I, it's, I don't think there's like a public health menace 
to the three drug combinations I'm using. And as Darcy asked, what about hepatitis B, active hepatitis B, hepatitis B surface antigen patients? Well, if you have a two drug regimen and those two drugs are dolutegravir and 3TC, you only have one active agent against hepatitis B and we've learned that's not sufficient. So if you discover this, you either need to add a second agent that's active against hep B or switch to a combination with two drugs, tenofovir, FTC. So this is a reason not to use two drug therapy or if you use two drug therapy, you have to add another drug. What is the proportion of people newly diagnosed or already diagnosed who are hepatitis B surface antigen positive? It's fairly low. It varies from location to location. On average, it's in the range of about 1%. And if you start somebody on hepatitis, with hepatitis B on 3TC alone, the earliest case of hep B becoming resistant because of exposure to 3TC alone, it took about six months. And in most cases, it takes uh, a, much longer than that. So if you did make a choice to put somebody on dolutegravir 3 tc and came back to hepatitis B service antigen positive, you haven't done harm. You can still then make a change and get what you want. But if you think this is an issue with your patient, I'm totally with you. Let's use a three drug regimen until we get the treatment results back. It doesn't really interested in test and treat. There's data from various places both in the uh, wealthy countries of the world and with the less wealthy countries of the world that starting people right after their diagnosis, at the time of their diagnosis, appears to have value. So here we have somebody who could have hepatitis B. They could have transmitted resistance and we may not be covering everything with dolutegravir 3TC. So we're doing a study to see what the role of this might be. Again, I'm okay with starting with a three drug regimen. You know, ID doctors, all doctors are by their very nature conservative and they'd rather make an error of commission than an error of omission. You'd rather give somebody four drugs, learn you only needed two, take two away, everything's fine, then give them two and learn you needed four and have to add them later and wonder what harm did I cause by not covering anything. So I'm perfectly fine. If you're anxious about this issue with starting three drugs, absolutely no problem. Get the results back. If they don't have significant resistance, if they're not hepatitis B surface antigen positive, then based on the Tango and hopefully not too far in the future, the salsa data, you may feel comfortable after things have settled down, they're suppressed for six months, to say, you know, you've done a really good job. Your viral load's undetectable. You're gonna live 40 more years if you take care of yourself. But now that you've done the hard work, we know that we can continue to have success, but not expose you to such an intensive regimen as was necessary to get you to where you are now. And consider whether switching to a true drug regimen might be a rational next step. And what about transmitted 184V, right? This is like, this is sort of the, the fear thing. It's like, if someone could attack your home, you better buy a gun. You know, we, 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 can, we can engender concern and fear about a problem. And one of the ways for two drug therapy based on 3TC is to say, what if they have 184V? Isn't that dolutegravir monotherapy? And don't we know that dolutegravir monotherapy doesn't work very well? And that when people fail, they may fail with integrase resistance. So let's explore that just a little bit. This is the M184 part. So first in the Gemini trials, and remember those for treatment naive population, the questions asked how many of them had M184V? Uh, it, it, they screened, though they didn't allow people in if they had M184V. There were 1,974 patients screened for the study. There were three patients with M184V 
so the rate is 0.15%. And in the US, CDC data makes it around 1% or less. In the Gemini, sequencing was not done because they're all suppressed, but afterwards, because of this concern, the company went back and did DNA archive resistance testing. They found that in the population of 626, there were seven who had M184V in the archive, four in the two drug arm, three in the three drug arm, and they were all less than 50 copies at the end of 48 weeks. And there was no resistance in either arm. So yeah, you can always worry about this, but the data in the two trials seems at least a little reassuring. Now, what about 3TC as a partner? And I'm running out of time here because I'm too long-winded. But remember, I, I made a inference to 3TC as the secret sauce. I want to show you a little bit of data as to why that may be so and why 3TC, which can be held up as a bad choice because of its low barrier to resistance, why it might be pretty good. Here's a paper published in AIDS in 2016 by Mark Weinberg, the late uh, much missed Mark Weinberg's lab in Montreal that did an experiment to say, if you have 184V or K65R or M184I, which is the other variant, does that change the potential of virus to acquire dolutegravir resistance? And so here's a table, These, and I apologize for the terrible reproduction this is, but this is me with a bad scanner trying to get this data here. What he found was in a wild type virus with serial passages, you could easily get resistance mutations to dolutegravir, raltegravir, and elvitegravir. But when you engineered the virus to have 184I or V, they were not able to, no matter how long they went through it, to get resistance to dolutegravir. The implication being, not proven, but the implication being that this resistance pathway creates an environment in which generation of dolutegravir resistance is particularly difficult. And hence the combination of 3TC, which as we know, M184B does what we call increase the fidelity of transcription, may create viruses for which dolutegravir resistance is particularly hard. So I want to finish with just some concerns. I, I had a lot more. One is cost. If you're going to do this, it has to be cheaper. Here's a paper that was published in CID in 2016 doing modeling of two drug therapy with dolutegravir 3TC compared to a triple combination. They found that the most cost-effective strategy in their model was to start with a three-drug combination for a year and then switch to two drugs. They did that. They saved uh, $550 million. But if the two-drug regimen at 48 weeks had 90% or more people below the level of detection, and you'll remember from Gemini, it was actually 91.5, then the starting with the two drug arm was the better strategy, saving 800 million. And if in addition to starting 25%, 50% of people on the two drug regimen, you took 25% of all those who are already suppressed and switched them to a two drug regimen, then you end up with more than $3 billion of savings. $3 billion of savings. It's really hard to compare prices in the United States, but right now the two drug combination of dietary CTC is in the range of 25 to 30% lower than standard three drug combinations. Okay, uh, I've run out of time. I wanted to talk to you about Atlas and Flare. You can see what they, how those names came to be. These are injectable two drug combinations. They look very promising. We anticipate that injectable two-drug combination therapy will be approved at the end of December and will be marketed in the first month or two of 2020. And I won't go through this because of the time. I'm sorry I didn't do the time right. 
most people who got injection therapy, 98%, and were then offered the chance to switch back to oral, preferred to stay on injections. Uh, there's a two-month interval study that will be presented at CROI. Press release said it met its expectations. There's a new drug by Merck called Islatravir that has a very uh, favorable half-life and could be used as part of a two-drug combination. Right now, they're adding it to Duravarine. Probably there's a better partner available, but this might be another strategy. And Gilead has a, what looks like a terrific um, capsid inhibitor. It's only in phase one testing. But it has an extraordinary half-life. Doses above, above 100 milligrams, so 30450. A single dose, a single dose was above the concentration needed to reach the EC95 after 12 weeks, one dose. So this could be a terrific long-acting agent. You take it, the appointment's over. Don't you have patience or you just like, that's enough. My favorite slide to end the talk. Half of what we have taught you is wrong. In, in a talk like this, maybe more than, but we have no idea which half right now. So this says you have to be a student forever if you're going to take care of patients. I'm sorry I went long, but thank you guys for coming. Think about two drugs. Is it a good idea? So, so don't take it off yet. So just real quickly, can I ask a question? So just to push back to give some thoughts and maybe some balance, you know, failure, the field has moved on, right? Therapy failure isn't just about uh, resistance and virologic failure, but it's the biggest thing that's killing our patients who are suppressed are cardiovascular disease and inflammation. So how does two drug therapy compare to three drug therapy for those um, yeah, that's conditions? A, obviously a critically important question. Um, there are in progress studies that uh, we anticipate will be presented by CROI and subsequent meetings to address that issue. I, I can tell you without citing actual numbers that to the best I can tell, the changes in inflammatory markers between two and three drugs are indistinguishable from one another. Certainly other measurements of the impact on the virus and then inferentially on inflammation, the rapidity with which virus is suppressed, the number of blips, the number of target not detected, there's no difference between two and three drugs. So inflammation is mediated by residual viral replication. There's no marker now that suggests it will be worse, but the studies need to be done. They've enrolled, the labs are working. Hopefully we'll have good information on that. Important question. Thank you. Okay, thanks guys.